So let me start by saying uh, that sometimes when you have a grand title like this or a big title, it helps you not worry about the details, but you can ask a question, uh, a, a kind of a problem with new questions. And this is what this exercise is about. Yeah, that's something that is so familiar to many of us and sometimes something that achieves a level of common sense like the Anthropocene almost in many departments teaching it. But if you take that common sense and that conventional way of thinking about it and pose new questions, do you see uh, the problem differently? And that's really what this effort is. So let me start by actually <clears throat> trying to produce some sort of backdrop. This is a, a lovely uh, uh, popular piece written by Julia Edney Thomas, a friend of mine, where she tries to, uh, very, uh, in a very brief way, convey that Anthropocene should not be synonymous with climate change. There is a difference. And it's very important to understand that difference. Yeah? And uh, in that short write-up, at some point she writes, we have always lived in the environment very recently. We have begun living in the, uh, in the altered earth system of the Anthropocene. Now, this is very significant. It's not about the environment, but the altered earth system. This is something that that distinction is conceptually very important to understand. And what is this earth system that is so crucial to the Anthropocene? So uh, what we do understand today, the science that actually talks about the Anthropocene is something that emerged in the 1960s. And this comes really as part of the Cold War thinking. So you get satellites put into, place, uh, into, into space, you get computers, you get modeling, and you get what Donna Haraway sort of uh, in one of her papers in 1988 said, it's the God trick, the conquest, the conquering gaze from nowhere in particular, because your satellites and your mapping and exploring uh, changes, uh, not uh, from a toad kind of or a frog's view of the ecosystem, but really from an eagle's vision, yeah? So the details blur, the larger patterns usually is what you're looking at. And Earth System Sciences <clears throat> is really a transdisciplinary endeavor. It's the social sciences, the humanities, and the sciences in a conversation over planetary level changes, yeah? And so when we talk about the Anthropocene, the conclusion, I mean, and, 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 and of course, what they, uh, they also underline uh, is that the whole Earth system, the planet, has got spheres, and five of them, the cryosphere, the atmosphere, the geosphere, the biosphere, and the um, hydrosphere, yeah? And these different spheres are linked through processes, through cycles, and through huge kinds of uh, entangled feedback loops. And so when we talk about the Anthropocene, the argument is that it is a shift in the Earth system. It is not simply a degraded environment or a, a destruction of forests or a drying up of a wetland. You're talking about, when you say the Anthropocene, a shift in the Earth system. That is to say that the previous epoch, the Holocene of the last 12,000, 11,000 years, the kind of predictability in terms of patterns of climate behavior, that is no longer what we're going to expect. That today there's a level of lack of predictability, there's a ability, I mean, there's a sense of surprise that uh, is unprecedented. And that is what the Anthropocene is about, yeah? This is a, uh, a kind of new climatic regime that we are completely unfamiliar with and it is unknown territory. Uh, and there's another aspect to this, <clears throat> and that is the, the human determined world. So uh, Julia marks very clearly there that uh, there are certain aspects that shows that the earth now is deeply impacted by the human uh, uh, intervention. So you've got 8.3 billion tons of plastic, you've got 193,000 human made uh, inorganic crystalline compounds that far exceeds the 5,000 that one would find as natural minerals. And not to mention that annually, we are moving more Earth 
24 times more than natural processes. So in some ways, the human impact is immense, and the Anthropocene acknowledges that as much as it is also a way of acknowledging that we are no longer in the climatic regime of the Holocene. Now, that having been said, the first time this, uh, this term Anthropocene gets a kind of legitimacy was in 2000. And partly the explanation was that in the Holocene uh, or the pre-industrial averages of, you know, uh, of carbon in the atmosphere was between 260 to 284 parts per million. That is, in every million uh, particles of the atmosphere, you got 260 to 284 uh, carbon uh, particles, yeah? But today, we're looking at something like 417 ppm, yeah? So you can see that measurably and you know, in terms of a quantification, uh, there is a huge dramatic shift, yeah? And how does one make sense of this? Now, this is a background to an article <clears throat> that actually is widely discussed. And many people in the social sciences would be familiar with the fact that Dipesh Chakrabarti wrote this piece in 2009. Uh, in which it was titled The Climate of History, and he advanced four theses. And in one of those, uh, I mean, before he begins the thesis, there's a section in that article where he says, uh, I realize that all my readings in theories of globalization, Marxist analysis of capital, subaltern studies, and post-colonial criticism over the last 25 years, while enormously useful in studying globalization, had not really prepared me for making sense of this planetary conjuncture within which humanity finds itself today. I mean, uh, a stunning declaration that all that I've sort of contributed and worked towards in the past, it's come to a moment of reckoning where all that I know might not explain what is happening to us today, yeah? Which is uh, quite a dramatic statement to make. And, um, he then begins to elaborate these four uh, theses. And why am I picking up uh, uh, Dipesh Chakravarti is because I really want to test this notion that are we all together in this? This idea that you know, we are facing and confronting together a common challenge, a common uh, catastrophe, a common crisis. Is it true that we are all in the Titanic together and are we going to face the consequences together? And on this fairly, I would say, uh, you know, conventional way of thinking about climate change, I'm really surprised how many writers and authors have actually turned around in different directions on this question. And that is why Dipesh is a useful uh, first person to start with. And so in the first um, thesis, he dramatically declares that human agency is torn out of its usual frame. It's no longer the human that we are used to. Yeah? And what does he mean by that? Well, he starts by saying that <clears throat> the Holocene uh, is the humans as a biological agent. So they have deforested, they have fouled rivers, they have uh, destroyed uh, wetlands, they have dammed. These are all actions as biological agents. But in the Anthropocene, he says, we are no longer biological. We are a geological force. What does he mean by that? He says that um, volcanic activities, for example, on a massive scale, or tectonic activities on a massive scale, or a meteorite colliding with the Earth, all these things that can in a single instant or in a short period of time, eliminate all life. And today, human beings have developed that capacity. They could be actually causing the sixth extinction event, ending all life. They have within their powers to end all life. And so he says, we are now a geological force. We are like nature uh, to be able to eliminate all life. Uh, and I just want to underline the power of this. This is uh, a very famous book that came out in uh, for environment historians, uh, uh, um, George Perkins Marsh, Man and Nature. And Perkins Marsh, uh, Marsh, this is one of the first books that documents human impacts on ecosystems and environments. And he kind of goes through an entire checklist of forest loss, wetlands dried up, species being rendered extinct. 
And so uh, Marsh assesses the injuries of human beings on nature. Yeah? But in that uh, entire book, there's this one set of lines where he distinguishes the biological agent from what uh, uh, <clears throat> Dipesh would call a geological force. He says, nature sometimes mocks the cunning and the power of man. A dangerous sandbank that all the engineering of the world could not dredge out in a generation may be carried off in a night by a strong river flood. That is, nature is so immense when it comes to changes, yeah, that even as a biological agent, we are nowhere near what nature can do as a capacity. Yeah? So this is the distinction between biological agent and uh, geological force. That is, when we become a geological force, uh, that we are not, we are like nature, powerful enough to wipe out all life. Now, what does Dipesh want to do with this distinction? He basically wants to say that now that we have become part of nature, and this is the real argument that he pursues, it is unlikely that global politics will solve global warming. That is a, a huge claim to make, that global politics will not solve global pol uh, warming, yeah? Because now we are a natural force, we are not when we were biological, we were part of, you know, a kind of capacity to, to get human beings to solve uh, human problems through politics. And so he then shifts that to the third level. And he says that the crisis of climate change calls for thinking simultaneously on both registers to mix together the immiscible chronologies of capital and species history. Suddenly he's calling humans species history. Species history is deep time, it is technical, it's biological, uh, it doesn't function in the realms of culture, power, politics, and interests, but something that stands apart in a very technical sense. And what you can see in that essay is an attempt to force a distinction between politics and its opposite, which is policy, right? So by the time he comes to the fourth, he's very clear, he says, Climate change refracted through global capital will no doubt accentuate the logic of inequality that runs through the rule of capital. Some people will no doubt gain temporarily at the expense of others. But the whole crisis cannot be reduced to a story of capitalism. And he says, unlike in the crisis of capitalism, there are no lifeboats here for the rich and the privileged. He is now saying we are all in this together. All right, okay, uh, uh, Dipesh is very clear that <clears throat> uh, humans as a geological force have the terrifying capacity to end life, and this cannot be sorted out through the realm of politics. This requires something that's non-political, which is technical, and which actually is the realm of policy. Now, immediately, 2014, you get a sharp rebuke from uh, two well-known uh, Scandinavian Marxists, so to speak. And they write there, uh, what, is he, what, is, what is this, all of us in together? You know, a significant chunk of humanity is not part of the fossil economy at all. Hundreds of millions uh, rely on charcoal, firewood, organic waste, such as dung for all domestic purposes, et cetera, et cetera. It blatantly overlooks, that is the page the realities of differentiated vulnerability on all scales of human society, witness Katrina and so on and so forth, and they just go on um, driving into the fact that, you know, uh, how can you not have politics? Or what is Dipesh talking about? Why is he putting uh, a Donald Trump or, uh, or a uh, Elon Musk on the same lifeboat as all of us, yeah? So there should be differentiation. And the, and the criticism does not stop. You get uh, uh, Shock of the Anthropocene, Bonnell and Frizo. I'm sure some of you must be familiar with it, 2016. And they talk about the differentiate, differentiated anthropos. And there's a certain sense of, uh, uh, you know, taking offense, literally, when they say, rather than a universal history of the human species, which Dipesh is hinting at, uh, distorting the Earth system, we proposed, we have proposed seven possible narratives, and they go on, thermocene, thanocene, phagocene. Basically, the, if you look at all those different narratives, they talk about the political economy of, of CO2, uh, they talk about the impacts of war, how there's differentiation, different kinds of vulnerability. 
and so on and so forth. There's a long list of how actually policy and politics come together and that you can't really distinguish the two. And But in the conclusion of this fantastic book, which can really give you high blood pressure if you read it energetically, they write, decent lives, this is a solution, decent lives in the Anthropocene therefore means freeing ourselves from repressive institutions, from alienating dominations and imaginaries. That's the best they've got. At the end of the day, let's overthrow what's wrong. All right? That's the best argument they've got after all this and saying that politics is still very important uh, as a way of talking about solutions. But perhaps <clears throat> the best uh, book, which is thick, outright, and an argument powerfully made against the page, actually, with lots of sources, primary sources, historians love it, is Fossil Capitalism by... Andreas Mab, and this comes out in 2016. So you can see, 2009, the paper comes out. By 2014, all these arguments, in 2016, all these arguments are coming and critiquing this belief that we're all in this together, yeah? So uh, Mab poses the question very simply. He says, what's the causes of the origins of the fossil economy? How did we get to where we are? And he wants to basically say that, um, very interestingly, this is a great line, he says, for every year global warming continues and temperatures soar higher, living conditions on Earth will be determined more intensely by the emissions of the past of Europe. Okay, so what he roughly says is that at the end he says the final falling in history on the present, that we are all victims of a certain past. And so only through a historical exercise can we uncover this deep crime. And if we uncover this crime, we will then find out that we are not all in this together. And uh, he wants to really use the example of the British Industrial Revolution, where he says the fossil economy really begins with the shift from the water wheel, which generates energy, and then becomes the coal-driven steam. So he says, how did this shift come about? And he comes up with some very surprising uh, and interesting evidence. First of all, he challenges the belief that, you know, Coal was inevitable, that it had a lot to do with taking off population pressure from the land. And there's some very interesting statistics, which I must say, I must give credit for compiling. He says, for example, coal, according to the Ricardo Malthus, Malthus thesis, coal resolved a crisis of overpopulation. So he shows that, you know, in 1750, the use of coal was uh, equivalent to 4.3 million acres of woodland would be required to generate that kind of energy. In, but because of coal, you did not have to use that. In 1800, it would be 35% of all Britain's territorial land would be used up for energy if you didn't have coal. And in uh, 1850, it's 150%. That is three times more than what, uh, uh, sorry, one and a half times more than entire territory of Britain. So coal basically was a response to a population crisis and their demand for energy. And then he says, the other thing is, uh, conventionally, that steam promised both temporal and spatial protection. That is, it freed production from the vagaries of season. So he says, you know, the argument is that fossil was inevitable. I mean, there's, there's, it's a logistical issue. It is not, I mean, he's criticizing this, but, but it's a logistical solution to making life better. But mom is not convinced, and he goes on to argue, and I'm not going to berate the point, but he goes on to argue that Actually, the moment when coal is used against the water wheel is really as a part of class struggle. He says that the water barons were fighting with the workers over the question of timing, about the amount of work time in the factory. And for various reasons, uh, the, the, uh, <clears throat> the steam uh, uh, capitalists were able to outmaneuver the workers by accepting steam rather than adopting the water wheel. So he ends up saying it was capitalist property relations that drove the need for steam. It wasn't that steam was uh, ineffective uh, or that it was solving problems, but that actually it was part of a class struggle. And so he ends up really uh, arguing that the choice of fossil fuel, the choice of steam, was completely a result of capitalist property relations, okay? Now, having said that, very convincing, very compelling, and a wonderfully scripted argument, 
he asks a very strange question towards the end of the book. Why do people not rebel? Why is it that fossil capital persists? If not unchallenged, then still safely ensconced in the driver's seat. And he says, how is it possible that the passengers do not overwhelm and throw it out or just wreck the train? If the worker was really a victim of the steam and coal, why did the worker not want to overthrow it? Okay, and he says, of course, there is a likely explanation, which is a simple one, that abstract character of climate change, you know, of science, maybe it's too abstract for people to take it on board, and all the creative ways in which we can argue that society carries out an exercise to, of collective denial, which could be true. But he then, he kind of gives up in between, and he says, the fossil economy has constituted the subject, that is the worker, who cannot see himself outside of it, and who really reflects upon, let alone articulates the ideological affiliation, uh, uh, who really reflects upon, sorry, this is a, this is a very uh, uh, pessimistic view of the worker. He says, the worker really reflects upon, let alone articulates the ideological affiliation. It is just there in the veins of material life. So he's accusing the worker of actually allowing fossil capital to get under his skin. And he says, so why would the fossil subject rise up to slake the fire? He would lose himself in the process. He is complicit. He is part of the fossil economy. So there is no solution. He says, it might have some bearing on middle strata, like the uh, professional middle class and setting itself, the intelligentsia and certain privileged segments of the working class, but not on the truly subaltern classes in a warming world. Pessimistic to the core. A great Marxist analysis who ends up saying the worker is too compromised to be part of a solution to global warming. And he says only if people were to break out of the stupor of consumption, this is the last bet, could any real change come about. So are we in this together? Yeah, uh, for, for, uh, for uh, Mark. Now, uh, if you take aside the, the, the political wrangling over who is to blame and who can solve. Uh, that's one set of writings. But there is another set of writings, and many of you might be familiar with uh, Johan Rockström. Again, the article comes out in 2009. <clears throat> it is pathbreaking. It has got, every day it gets more citations. So I last saw it when it was 15,000. It could be more as I finished the sentence. Yeah, uh, it's widely cited. And what they argued is that <clears throat> let's rethink what the Earth system is and let's think of certain boundaries and they name nine and they quantify it and they measure it and they say, let's not try to transgress these boundaries. And within these boundaries, it's a safe operating space. Do what you're doing, just don't cross the boundaries. Yeah, And they provide very compelling arguments uh, for a stewardship unabashedly a stewardship of the planet. And they say, pursue pro prosperity within a safe operating space. And who are these people who are going to do this? A science-based agenda, the professional manager classes, i.e. us, educated, uh, and looking for innovators, problem solvers, entrepreneurs, and small businesses working within the Earth's safe operating space. We can solve it as long as we don't cross a boundary, yeah? And the <clears throat> magnitude of their arguments is such that um, they completely upturn the dominant framework of 1972. Uh, some of you might be familiar with this, the limits to growth argument that uh, uh, very Malthus that there are more people than resources, and so we must limit growth as much as we limit the number of people on the planet. So it was a negative approach towards the crisis of uh, uh, rising population growth and uh, limited resources. Instead of that, uh, the uh, planetary boundaries people say, no limits to growth, but growth within limits. They just turn it around, okay? And so this is a new paradigm of prosperity. And there are many people who find it convenient that this is a technical solution. Right? Uh, innovators and science and professional people. You don't need politics, you just know, need to stay within the boundaries. Now, uh, this would make perfect sense, perhaps, to the developed world, 
But South Asia <clears throat> has its problems with anyone talking about um, <clears throat> solutions that do not recognize historical wrongs and historical injustices, okay? Uh, South Asia is, of course, India is part of it. But between 1757 to 1947, it was under colonial rule. Uh, there are many large arguments saying that uh, this region, this continent was denied the possibilities of development because of colonialism, extraction of resources, the creation of poverty. And so we are not on the same page when it comes to climate change and the Anthropocene. And we need a great deal of leeway in order to move ahead. Yeah? And I have a paper which, uh, <clears throat> which really discusses uh, how uh, this is a uh, huge uh, issue of discussion about climate injustice yeah? and how environmental historians of South Asia tackle that. But <clears throat> before I get to the historians, um, the, the, the template for this was really laid in 1991 by a non-governmental NGO. Uh, Sunita Narayan and Anil Agarwal, and they brought out this uh, booklet then called Global Warming in an Unequal World. And this was astounding, their intervention in 1991. And it became a real rallying point for the entire quote unquote third world, where they said they did three things. One is they said uh, they contested climate responsibility based on annual national emissions. They said, you know, you can't uh, treat all the countries equally because they've had different histories. So we can't have only uh, climate responsibility based on annual national emissions flows. Two, the responsibility should be based on a nation's cumulative contributions to emissions stocks. That, uh, that is basically taking into account history. Yeah, uh, who has been polluted more through what period of time? And then they brought in this per capita, so China and India look completely different in their calculations. And they wanted to make a distinction between survival and luxury emissions. Again, are we all in this together is the kind of thing that will come up. And they very squarely say at some point, a detailed look at the data presented, this is 1991, leads to the conclusion that India and China cannot be held responsible, even for a single kilogram of carbon dioxide or methane that is accumulating in the Earth's atmosphere. The accumulation in the Earth of these gases is mainly the result of the gargantuan consumption of the developed countries, particularly the United States. And then they use this word climate colonialism. All right? This is an uh, astounding document because it did influence the UNFCC and I think influenced the 1997 Kyoto Protocol, that we're not, we not all on the same page together. But you would be surprised to also know that in this very same document, <clears throat> whom did they actually decide to name as the possible people who can take us out of this crisis? Whom do we trust? It wasn't surprisingly the government of the third world countries. They made a strong case <clears throat> for the village ecosystem. And they said that development strategies will have to be ecosystem specific and holistic it will be necessary to plan for each component of the village ecosystem and not just trees from grasslands, forest lands, and crop lands to water, but the entire village ecosystem. Basically, they were rooting for the small guy, the villager and the small village economy. Uh, it will demand bold and imaginative steps to strengthen and deepen local democracy by creating and empowering democratic and open village institutions. Only then will people get involved in managing their environments. And they ended up by saying, the government is the biggest and the worst land and water owner in the country. So they really wanted to go beyond governments. They wanted to go back to village democracy. They wanted to go back to the small guy who is given in charge of his resources, him, her, whatever, resources. And then they plan out uh, the solutions. The belief was, the small guy in the village really has an answer to fossil capitalism, yeah? And where did they get their ideas from, actually? They got their ideas from South Asian environmental historians. Uh, most prominently, a book that came out in 1989 by Ramchandra Guha, in which uh, this is considered the first self-consciously uh, beginning of environmental history of South Asia, where he studied uh, a movement called the Chipko movement. 
And he basically said uh, the small village community um, had the wisdom and had the uh, abilities to actually harmoniously evolve with nature. And it was really the developmental state and big industry that was actually responsible for the destruction of environments, okay? And he, he then, along with an ecologist called Madhav Gadgil, upped the ante in a later book that came out in 1992, in which they said something quite dramatic. They said the pre-colonial world, that is South Asia, in the Indian subcontinent was marked by a considerable degree of social coherence and ecological stability, implying that the past was harmonious, traditional society had all the answers, and they end up by saying homogenous, self-sufficient communities living in ecological equilibrium. British colonialism brought in Western industrialization and consumerism and destroyed ecological harm. So we have the good guys and we have the bad guys. Yeah, okay? Uh, and so their political model looks something like this. Save ecological harmonious communities from the developmental state, i.e. the Indian government. Find out these self-reliant, decentralized village communities, empower them. The locality lives with nature and balance. This nature and balance itself was, a, was very criti criticized a great deal much later. And then they ended up saying, the present was about taking a detour in the past in order to get to the future. Go back to your past. It's full of wisdom, nice people, yeah, and small communities. Of course, uh, this did not go away uncontested. And by 1995, 1997, a slew of books saying there was no golden age. People have been changing the environment endlessly and destroying all kinds of ecosystems, yeah? Where did they get this imagination from? And this new school of thought called the continuities with change and saying, it's not the, Brit the British, of course, were a huge impact, but they were not the only ones. The, the periods in the past also experienced many kinds of changes. And this uh, group, interestingly enough, did not think environmental politics was the solution. They thought environmental policy making really was the way out. So what you need to do is to get into the past, use it as an ingredient for the ideological present. So get into policy making. And uh, environmental history should address courts, committees, and commissions. Uh, it is the domain of the expert that we have to inform. Yeah, okay? They're not, they're not rooting for the small guy anymore, yeah? But uh, alongside that um, comes the third school called the globalists, who basically say, you know, ecological change in South Asia played out within globalizing processes. Uh, such as European colonial expansion, capitalism, science, modernity, climate change, and Western environmentalism. So a lot of the writings in this school um, <clears throat> don't, they, they want to restore politics, but they want to restore global politics. They don't want to see policy making as something that, you know, you can fine tune to uh, problem solving at the micro level. And um, Vinita Dhawan is a major advocate of this school. Um, and where they basically argue South Asia's globalized past are key to understanding the shaping of the region's future environments, yeah? So we've got this three-part story, yeah? You get the future is a detour into the past. The past provides ingredients for the making of the ideological present. And then how South Asia's future environments must reckon with their global pasts, yeah? So all of these schools continue to contend uh, this is now slightly weak, uh, the harmoni harmonious school, but they've all fed very much, very actively into the Kyoto Protocol of 1997, which said common but differentiated responsibilities. Yeah? And so you had um, environmental histories of South Asia really informing issues of historical injustice and climate uh, justice issues. Yeah? However, <clears throat> Come to 2014, another big marker. And this is where uh, I'm going to try and interest you in thinking differently. Uh, today, uh, there are two, two articles. One is a book and one is an article by myself. We, we sort of, and we're writing a piece together uh, on, on something similar. Uh, Yifei and, uh, I, I, of course, I had the book on the table, but I should read it until I wrote the piece, and then after it got published, I had to read his book for another review and suddenly realized I should have read it before and 
my article would have been so much better. And it goes again that the Chinese have always done something first. Yeah. Uh, so the rise and rise of state-led environmentalism in India and China. This is a new way of thinking about the environment, uh, which is beginning to emerge post, and we have a date, post-2014. Yifei, for example, says, <clears throat> in, if you look at China, instead of focusing on the right to development, this is all 2009 in the, uh, in the COP rounds and so on and so forth. Instead of focusing on the right to development, technology transfer from developed to developing countries, financing for mitigation and adaptation, absolute sovereignty over natural resources, and common but differentiated responsibility, by 2014, the Chinese leaders begin to speak about climate change and other environmental challenges as shared global threats. How did this happen? The sudden shift from accepting that you have inflicted climate injustice to say it's not an issue anymore. Yeah, we're going to lead the pack as far as solving the problem of climate is concerned. And you get something very similar in India with this new government. I, I should be careful and not say too many things about him. Uh, but uh, again, the Modi dispensation radically changes the entire climate uh, uh, politics and philosophy on the ground. I write in my article, the Modi dispensation in folding climate justice into the energy transition debate has steadily fashioned a type of state-led environmentalism. That is, the official rhetoric for saving the planet is narrowed to a technocratic quest for renewables while deliberately sidestepping calls for decarbonizing society through radical political and economic transformation. Uh, if you see the Indian government's rhetoric, they don't want uh, any democracy on the question of the environment. So a uh, lot of institutions, a lot of committees that have looked at environmental issues have been gutted. Uh, people have been fired, uh, government cronies have been put in, they've passed all kinds of uh, rules and laws in which there is actually no resistance to the environmentalism of the state. Yeah? And Yife and I both conclude uh, that there's an inverted picture. These are his words, not mine. Whereby authoritarianism is the end and environmentalism is the means. So you get this interesting shift where the environmental project is now uh, the means uh, to the end for authoritarian rule and extension of government control uh, over people and spaces and environments. Yeah? And so back to Dipesh Chakravarti, yeah, who in some ways <clears throat> tried to suggest that the species being was a obvious demand for policy, yeah, uh, that was to be crafted by the professional managerial class, yeah, and they should, and that policy should command and control global politics. That is really the implication of his essay as I read it. And uh, in order for the we to survive and flourish in the Anthropocene. So the Anthropocene at some level, its solutions are not going to be in the realm of politics, but in policy choices and policy uh, engagements. Yeah? But what happens when policy itself becomes part of a political project? Yeah? Which is the question Yifei and myself uh, argue. So are we in this together um, is the question. And uh, my very modest intervention in that is that not if authoritarian environmental policies are allowed to undermine politics and the quest for democratic values. Yeah, uh, that what you're seeing in India and China today are appalling by any standards of democratic consensus building. Yeah, what you're getting is strong states led by uh, populist leaders. Uh, who have a disdain for democratic feedback, yeah? And so to actually discuss climate justice today uh, without recognizing this kind of right-wing shift within uh, the domains of politics uh, would be, I would say, being inadequate here. Yeah? And I should end at that by, uh, you know, this is a, this is a kind of uh, exercise that WWF and the Prado Museum of art tried to do to tell us a little bit about what these paintings would look like. So this is a 1635 painting 
uh, which would look very different, uh, obviously, in today's conditions. Uh, I think part of the effort is to show us the urgency, not that horses can swim. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I should end at that. And thank you so much. And uh, I hope uh, there is some argument here that you could disagree with. Yeah. Thank you.